This is the DRF Players Podcast. Hello and welcome to the October 21st edition of the DRF Players Podcast, broadcasting live through the magic of Spreaker. If you're interested, if you're one of our pod people and you're hearing this uh, a few hours later and you're interested in joining us live, easiest way to find the live feed right now is either through Spreaker itself or through my Twitter feed, at Looms Boldly. You can go on there and join us live. We're going to be giving a full schedule of live events coming up. I'm your host, Peter Thomas Fornatal, back with you, joined by the usual crew and a special edition who we'll get to in a second. First off, though, from the DRF offices in New York, it's Mike Hogan. Hello, Pete. And from, I don't know what happened. A couple of weeks ago, he joined us on the show. He was circling around Austin in his private jet. From the sound of things on the other end of the line, today the private jet must be in the shop because it sure as hell, sec- it sure as heck, sounds like you're in an airport. Hey, Jonathan. Yeah, no. The the problem is, is that you reminded me that we've had Gabby on twice, and I wasn't here, so I didn't want her to develop a complex. So I <laughs> I felt like I had to make sure I participated today. There you go, and 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 there it is the the, the reveal of our special guest for today. One of our favorite returning guests. You know her from her fantastic work she did on the Naira show this summer. And, of course, the Laurel simulcast feed, also a regular visitor on At the Races with Steve Bick. She is Gabby Gaudette. Gabby, how are things? Uh, things are very well. We're ramping up for a big weekend here in Maryland with Maryland Million Day uh, quickly in our sights. But I'm really excited to be on the show for the first time with Jonathan Kinchin. So it's very exciting this morning. He's not just a rumor. It's not a, a, a snuffleupagus in the old days situation. He actually <laughs> exists and comes on the show once in a while and uh, has been known to give out a, a winner or two. We're going to get to an analysis of this weekend's public handicapper races in the latter part of today's show with Mike and JK and me. But Gabby, while we have you, I figured we'd just take a few minutes to roundtable you some questions. And we'll start off with Maryland Million Day itself. Uh, is there a particular moment on this card that you're really looking forward to checking out uh, as a fan and an analyst of horse race? Well, as an analyst, I would say there are some really, really competitive races uh, on the entire card. We have, uh, of course, the Maryland Million to Staff Starter Handicap and the regular Starter Handicap. And, you know, those are the backbone uh, type of horses in our industry, those hard-knocking claimers, I would say. And those races are crazy to handicap sometimes so from a betting uh perspective those races uh usually pave the way to some good value but as a fan i'm really excited to see ben's cat in the maryland million sprint this horse a 10 years old of course 32 time winner king leatherberry uh a little bit you know upset because they took his race away from him a few years ago so he opted for uh, usually every year he either opts for the maryland million sprint which is six furlongs on on the dirt or the turf, which is a flat mile on the turf. So this year he's going to the sprint and always a Maryland fan favorite, really an East Coast fan favorite. Super cool horse like Old Man River. He just keeps rolling along. What's the prognosis for him this year? You think he's, uh, I think we could have a, a fairy tale type story with Ben's cat? I hope so. And it's funny when you talk to King Leatherberry, a lot of the time you talk to connections and trainers and, uh, they they take the optimist approach, and uh, King Leatherberry always takes the realist approach, no matter what. And he said, you know, when he first started off this year, he thought he was going to be sitting on a big season. He won at Laurel. It was a fantastic performance. He came back and won at Pimlico. That was a, a great performance, one of my favorite <clears throat> of Ben's cat. And then since then, he's kind of tapered off. And King actually saying he's not running the same numbers this year as he as he used to. So he's really hoping for a big performance, I think. The optimistic side of things are his workouts that he put in since his last race. They actually worked him a mile here at Laurel after the Laurel Dash <clears throat> and then just um, breezed him 5-8 uh, most recently under Trevor McCarthy. And Trevor McCarthy saying that that's his best work that he's had since he's been aboard Ben's Cat. So uh, there are some good things and uh, that we're looking forward to on Saturday. $2.6 million, over $2.6 million Ben's cat has earned. How fun would that be if we can get a glory days run in? Mike Hogan, what do you have for Gabby? Well, I'm glad, Gabby, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the works for Ben's cat because there, it's so much more than just the final times because you look at those works. 
a mile in 150 flat, five furlongs in a minute five flat. And you might think, hmm, I don't know if those are really those kinds of optimistic works. It's not like the the three furlongs in 34 and two. Um, so it's really great to hear. And that's why so much about the workouts are more than just the actual times. It's about how the horse moved, how the, how the rider felt. Um, so that's fantastic information. Cause that was actually one of the questions I was going to ask. Did he, did he mention anything about that workout pattern since? He did. And he said, you know, they just wanted to put the mile in him to get his wheels turning again. They really weren't impressed by his performance in the Laurel Dash. I mean, it was a tough race. You have Mosler in there. Uh, Triple Burner came back to win a nice allowance here uh, recently. So there are some good things to like about the Laurel Dash, but I don't think King was over the moon about his performance. So they took him out, worked him a mile. They cut him back a bit to four furlongs in the slop, and then they put in that five furlong workout. Um, And the one thing that King Leatherberry says that he liked about the, the workout was uh, Trevor McCarthy just has the, gives Ben's cat the ability to relax. And a lot of the time when you see a workout, you want them to go slow early and pick it up in the latter half of the work. And Ben's cat doesn't always do that, but he absolutely did that in the five furlong workout uh, on October 15th. So, you know, you want to see that progression and Trevor McCarthy saying the same thing, you know, he didn't, start off that quickly but he really finished strong and that's what you want to see in a horse that's great jk why don't you jump in with uh, one of your questions so my first question is a simple one i might be dumb but so why why do they have why is there six horses and there's like four three also eligible (laughs) that's a great question actually um so we are giving preference to the maryland million sired horses And then the Maryland bred horses are going to be on the also eligible. And there's going to, that happens with a couple of races on the day. So if it scratches down to a five horse field, then only do the also eligibles draw into the race because those are Maryland bred, not necessarily Maryland million sired. So again, it has to scratch down to a five horse field or less for those horses to draw in. No, I don't feel so dumb. I, I was like, I have no idea. Someone asked me, and I was like, uh. It's complicated. Sure. Yeah. Uh, the, the other question I want to ask you is, um, is you know, we, we're, we've we're had uh, our friend Pipes on last week, and, and he was lucky enough with Angel Cruz to have his, his second greatest stakes win at Keeneland. And, and I just want to get your impression just watching Maryland racing as much as you do and being as involved as you are. With the kid Angel Cruz, do you, are we looking at a star in the making, or, or what's the deal with him? I think he's very, very good. And it's funny, I kind of have a little story. So judge me or not, I joined the backstretch league playing soccer. And nice. um, we actually, because I've always been a fan of soccer. I've played it all my life. So we got a whole group of people to join the backstretch league. Um, and Angel is, is actually one of them. So he's just all around an absolutely athletic person. That's the only way I can describe him. Like he's like the energizer bunny. He can do anything. He can be anywhere. And uh, it, really, he's just such an athlete and it's, it's showing. And I'm glad that, you know, he's going to the big stage and he's, he's being able to kind of showcase his talents because it is really difficult in Maryland. People, you know, either agents or outfits, um, they really are, they stay true to certain uh, jockeys and, and agents here. So sometimes it's difficult to break in unless you, of course, have uh, previous history, say Edgar Prado, uh, who came back to the Maryland circuit this year. So it is difficult to break into a, a, a circuit like Maryland, but I think he's doing a great job and this can only help him. He, he tries. And like I said, he's extremely athletic. He still has a lot of raw talent. Before we totally get off the topic of the Maryland million card, I imagine on your Steve Bick appearance today, Gabby, you'll be going through it uh, through and through. But was just curious to maybe have you identify another spot for uh, some some of our listeners who aren't regular players of Maryland racing who might be having an extra eye on the Laurel simulcast feed this weekend. Something else, another spot maybe betting-wise specifically where they might be able to sink their teeth into 
Well, like I said, throughout the card, I think when you get to the Maryland, the baby races, the Maryland Million Nursery, um, that's for two-year-old boys. And then we also have the Maryland Million Lassie, that's for two-year-old girls. If you are a fan of handicapping baby races, um, and that these races came up pretty tough, you know, they can just pop out of nowhere with some uh, big performances. I actually... We're talking about one race in particular. I love the Lassie. I love a long shot. Um, and that's the seven for Johnny for Mike Trombetta. This horse is 12 to one. I probably will go off even higher than that. Um, second time starter, but had a lot of excuses. And in, in her first start, she got caught behind a slow pace and really couldn't close in. And she didn't break well either. So Mike Trombetta actually taking her back to the gate, putting blinkers on her, a nice workout from the gate. Uh, second best on the day. So you get Steve Hamilton, again, another rider who has come out of a 10-year retirement. Mike Trombetta, she's definitely going to get overlooked, but I'm not going to let her run without putting a bet on her. Hey, after what we saw from uh, Rich Hill the other night in baseball, this uh, re- retirement back to the big leagues, it's, 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 I think it's becoming a thing, wouldn't you say, Mike? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we've seen it before. I mean, Gary Stevens, uh, you know, plenty of times you hear about people uh, that, that hang it up and then uh, they just can't stay away for too long. Um, so, Gabby, let's let's shift gears a little bit and ask about your, your, your little bit of a globe trotter. Obviously, Pete mentioned doing Saratoga uh, this summer back in Maryland now. What are your plans for the, not just the rest of this year, uh, but for 2017? Are you going to Breeders' Cup, and then um, are you potentially coming back to New York next summer? Um, yeah, so the plan right now is to go to finish out a little bit here um, in Maryland, obviously get through the major weekends, Maryland Million, and then I will be going out to Breeders' Cup uh, to do the same thing as I did last year. We did the Breeders' Cup Player Show uh, at Keeneland, So I'll be joining pretty much the same cast of characters there, but this time at lovely Santa Anita. So I'm very excited about that. Um, And then as we move along, I'll be going down to Gulfstream for the winter meet once again, as I did last year. Um, And then hopefully it's still in the sites that we go back up to the Fox Sports show and the Saratoga Live show. I thought it was a huge success. Um, And I think the second year would potentially be even better than, than the first. Uh, so that's kind of what, in, in the time between, usually I come back to Maryland. Obviously, my family is here, too, um, in between the, the summer meet at Saratoga and, um, and the Gulfstream winter meet. So that's pretty much my schedule as it stands now. But, you know, things change from day to day. So we take it in stride. <laughs> Gabby, if you have anybody, you need anybody to come on that show and talk about the Breeders' Cup betting challenge uh, out at Santa Anita, I, I can sneak on the set and provide uh, provide <laughs> updates. It's going to be a lot of fun out there. Uh, one of the players who will be competing in that event is uh, our own Jonathan Kinchin. JK, we got about uh, two or three more minutes left with Gabby. You got something else you want to ask her about the Breeders' Cup or anything else? I did. I wanted to pick her brain. I haven't seen Gabby in a while. I wanted to see what uh, she's she's excited about uh, betting anything at the Breeders' Cup. Obviously, she wants to make sure that they're not uh, head over pony in the in the in the post parade. But uh, <laughs> if she has if she has anything, she's uh, excited about betting. Looking forward to the first week in November. Well, I'm just excited in general for the event. I mean, I've worked the Breeders' Cup for the past two years, once for Horse Racing Radio Network, and then obviously last year for Breeders' Cup doing the player show. Um, And I think this year is going to be outstanding. You just look at the horses that are pointing towards it. I have been so impressed as the entire nation with California Chrome's campaign. Um, Really looking forward to the juvenile races, too, the juvenile turf uh, primarily. I just think it's going to be a fantastic year. Trying to wrap my head around the day, uh, but I'm looking forward to it in in a broad sense, I would say. Um, But definitely we'll be looking for that HOP and probably reporting on it uh, in the post parade. So listen up. For folks head over pony angle. Yeah, for folks who haven't heard our previous discussions of of head over pony, Gabby, maybe uh, just explain briefly what that is and why it's a why it's a negative, and then we'll let you go about uh, the rest of your busy day here. Well, it's a very fine line. So when the horses are being uh, were being ponied in the post parade, 
uh, the horse sometimes puts its head over the pony's <laughs> neck. And it's, it's goofy to say, but it's got a really high success rate. So I'm going to keep on going with it. Um, it's worked for me in the past. And, but yeah, so that's pretty much it. The horse, either the horse puts its head over the pony, but there, like I said, there's a fine line. We're on, there's no visual that I can give you right now, but hopefully I get the opportunity to really explain it to you. That, that fine line of where the, the head crosses over the pony's neck. You so got, you got to watch, got to watch the player show. We're not talking about like that cool rocking horse motion where they're sort of nudging the pony <laughs> along. We're talking about, they take it that one step farther and that head goes over the pony toss is Gabby's advice. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> All right, Gabby, we'll let you get on with it. Uh, thank you so much for joining us here. We hope to have you on again very soon. All right. Always fun and uh, good luck uh, with everything and hopefully see you guys soon. Absolutely. At Breeders' Cup. Thanks, Gabby. All right, gentlemen. That was fun. Always great to get the update from Gabby. And it sounds like she's got a couple good ideas for us on the Maryland Million card, which is one of the things we'll be looking at this weekend. Um, Jonathan, so you're in the airport. I can only presume, I never know with you. Sometimes you have a few stops in between. Are you just simply flying to Lexington to, to, to go to Keeneland now? Or are you going to like, uh, hit anywhere exciting along the way? A little pit stop in Vegas or something? Oh no, Charlotte. I got to stop in Charlotte. So, um, yeah, so I'll stop in Charlotte. They have a TCBY, so that's good. So I'll probably hit that, um, get the chocolate (laughs) vanilla swirl with Oreos and go on with my day. I know there are a lot of New Yorkers listening, and they're going to relate to it when I talk about um, flying to Lexington from New York. It's really – you would think it would be easy. New York City, right? I mean, and, and Lexington is – you know, Lexington is a uh, still a – it's like a real place that people go, especially in the horse racing business. I, I have My flight options are just beyond brutal. I'm, I'm basically on like a 10 o'clock flight tonight, which is bad enough and annoying enough. I, if there was, had been something in the morning, I would have tried to go and, and be racing at Keeneland today. But where the, the real kicker is the way back, where the only direct flight is that uh, 5.30 in the morning, a special out of Lexington to New York that I'm sure our friends from uh, Breeders' Cup and the NTRA have, have taken many, many times. But it, it's a little bit of a pain. It almost makes me think, should I get over my pathological fear of never wanting to change airplanes? You travel all the time, JK. What, what would you, what would your advice be between annoying flight times direct, which is what I choose or trying to find sensible flight times, but dealing with connected? Oh, I don't mind. I mean, if I connect, you know, like I said, you know, I've, I've joked about it or talked about my, you know, my standby life with my mom retiring from American, my whole life I've been standby. So the idea of sitting in the airport for six, seven, eight hours, it doesn't sound like a great idea, but I'm just used to it. It's part of traveling for me. So I don't mind hopping planes, switching planes. Um, like you like you said, my travel plans change all the time. It's Chicago to you know, thinking I'm going to Dallas. I'm going to Chicago. I think I'm going there. I'm not <laughs> driven, driven home from Vegas one time. I mean, just crazy stuff. So it's just part of it. I can deal with it. All right. Sounds good. Uh, Mike Hogan, we, we, I think we should chat a little bit more about some general stuff going on in racing before we get into the four public handicapper races this weekend. Uh, any, uh, there's been some Breeders' Cup news this week, some horses who've been declared out, some horses who are being considered. Of the Breeders' Cup news you've seen this week, is there anything in particular that stands out that you think might be worthy of discussion for a few minutes on the show this morning? Well, you know, I mean, <clears throat> I think there was an announcement made about a, a particular horse and uh, which race that he was going to run in, be it the Dirt Mile or the Breeders' Cup Classic. And, uh, you know, there were a lot of people that seemed convinced that the connections were going to decide that Frosted would go in the Dirt Mile. Uh, and, and, I, you know, I said it on the podcast. I, I said it on Twitter. Uh, there was There's one opinion that I was 100% sure of, like, I would have bet whatever money you wanted to give me, whatever odds you wanted to give me, I would have taken that Frosted was going to end up in the in the BC Classic. Uh, and uh, there we go. I don't have to eat my hat. I don't have to eat crow. I don't have to do any of that. Now, I agree with you, Mike. And, and from the beginning, um, you know, your, your point on that made sense. But let me ask you this. The yep. fact that when directly questioned about it, a lot of times uh, in the in the previous couple of weeks, Kieran McLaughlin himself was a little indecisive. Was that, and, I'll, and we'll put this question to J.K. Was was 
that a case of just full deference to his employer? Or does it just put like the seed of doubt in, the, in your mind that, that maybe he really wanted to go in the mile? No, I think when you work for the when you work for Shake Mo, I think you do what he tells you to do, and I think that it's dangerous to start telling people what you're going to do when it's his decision to be made. So I think it was just, I think he was just uh, deferring uh, to the boss to see what they wanted to do. Uh, J.K., what percentage? If you're playing verticals in the Breeders' Cup Classic, what percentage uh, w- uh, will Frosted be on even in the even in the third spot? Zero. Even in the third spot, zero? No, no, I don't want that horse at all. I'd, I'd rather have opportunity in the third spot than him. I, you know, I'm kind of bummed that he's running in this race. I, I wanted him in the race where I where he was going to be the shortest price because I'm against him regardless. So, um, you know, he'll be he would have been shorter in the miles, so that would have been a, an easier way to, to take a stand. But no, I, I don't I don't want him at all. I mean, it, it, I, I just I'm just not a believer. <laughs> I'm not a believer. Does it, you think he's tailing off? You got to give us a little more than that. What's your uh, what's what's your concern about him? Well, I mean, I hate to say the phrase, but I just think you know he's he's viewed in a positive light because of a performance that everything went his way in, in, in that one turn situation. I just think he's a better horse going one turn, and I think that um, the the Whitney when he won the Whitney, it was. I wasn't that impressed. He got an easy lead. It wasn't the the, the best field in the world, and I, I just. I, I'm just not a fan Makes for sense. whatever reason. Yeah, Mike, you know, it's, I, are you now you who were so convinced he was going to run in the Breeders' Cup Classic? Is, is he a horse you could see uh, using at least in the bottom of verticals? Hmm, probably not. If so, only really defensively with some other bombs in there. But I can tell you this. There is no way I will be playing any tickets that have uh, like, say, tries or supers that have California Chrome, Arrogate, and Frosted all in the same scenario. Just it's a, It will not happen because that, uh, that payout, that, that possibility is going to be such a low payout compared to how likely I think that combination is going to be. So I will most likely just take a stand against, uh, similar to Jonathan. And, and what Jonathan said, it's funny. So I'll take a second to, to – veer off for for a minute I, please I no, think, we're, we're done with that topic let's move well, to the next thing well we're i think it's it's final enough that i can actually announce it on air there's there's a very good chance that in the near future we, we will have a mixing board which will allow us to use audio clips and sounds and just open up a lot more options from a production standpoint which will re- be really really fun what I really wish right now I had was the ability when Jonathan was talking about Frosted to hit a button and have Jonathan kind of from a distance saying, he's a one-turn horse. <laughs> that, that button would have gotten a lot of use uh, throughout this uh, Triple Crown season and this, and this summer, that's for sure. Um, but, but going back to Frosted for a second, Kieran in general. So the other point I was going to make about the Dirt Mile, regardless of whether or not you think he should go there and what most likely winner – Godolphin and Kieran, they have Tamarcoos in the dirt mile. Why would they why would they jeopardize the chances of Tamarcoos who well what was he gonna be a third or fourth choice? You know, he's not gonna be a ridiculous long shot in a race by putting their best horse in there when this best horse is probably gonna be third or fourth choice in, in the biggest race of of the year, you know. So that was that was my feeling. The other reason why I'm likely to toss Kieran is just his lifetime stats in California. 0 for 22 with only six in the money at Santa Anita. I know a lot of that is Breeders' Cup, but look, we're talking about Breeders' Cup here. It's he doesn't have a history of winning there. We've talked about West Coast horses on dirt being better than East Coast horses on dirt. We've talked about this horse being better at a one-turn mile. All of these things line up to me wanting to try and play against him. You've got me wanting to have that soundboard really bad, Mike, because I want to play the sounder we've yet to write. But for the segment we've done once or twice on the show already. Good stat, bad stat. And I'll put the question to Jonathan. The Kieran McLaughlin stats outside of New York, Mike just gave the California ones, but the ones of him anywhere outside of New York are similar. I don't know if you have them at the ready, Mike. I doubt it. Uh, no, well, no, but I can I can actually, when we pivot to the Raven run, I can talk about him in, in Kentucky too. Okay, well, um, just generally speaking though, J.K., yeah. your impression, is that is, good stat, bad stat? Does that give you pause about – Kieran McLaughlin runners in graded stakes outside of New York. I typically think the geographical, um, the geographical stats are usually good stats when it comes to how trainers perform 
in certain jurisdictions. And, and, and I hate to be cynical, but, you know, there's certain things that certain trainers can do in certain places that they can't do in other places, and I think it can affect the way their horses run. And, and I'm not saying that that about Kieran. I'm just saying in general, uh, I think it's a stat. You know, the Jorge Navarro one uh, in New York is, is obviously one that we've talked about before. John Sadler, uh, anywhere, you know, anywhere east of, outside of, of, California. of, Cal- <laughs> outside of California is, 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 uh, is abysmal. So, you know, I think there's, 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 real, you know, there's real, you know, legs to that idea. So I, I think it's a good stat. Uh, getting back to uh, talking Sadler specifically. So when one of his horses sort of breaks that trend and runs a winning race, say in a race like the Breeders' Cup Distaff last year, does that at all make you give that horse extra credit for bucking the trend of a trainer who typically doesn't do well in certain uh, geographies? Not to dodge the question, but I think it, it depends on how the horse wins. If the horse wins on a loose lead or it wins with a setup, blah, 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 blah. Well, specifically I mean, those... talking about stellar wind. Um. I mean, I bet you she never runs out of California again. <laughs> right. You know, I, well, I, I, I think that I think that you know you got to keep in mind that that it, it's it's not a it's not a, a tell all stat, but I think it's a stat that, that can lead you to some ideas that make a little bit of sense. You know, with with like Baltus, Baltus' stats aren't great um, outside of California. Okay, so let me ask you this, Jonathan: Why do you pick him every single time he has a runner <laughs> in a race? We talk about on the DRF Players Podcast because uh, I happen to like because <laughs> I, I like the horses and and. Uh, and, um, yeah, I don't know. I guess Again, gonna... th- this is where I wish I had that soundboard <laughs> so we could play go and do the chapel. <laughs> They're just wedded. To, that is going to be another good sounder, usually for horses. But it does seem like you do. That seems like a, a trend that you feel like the Baltus one seems like when you feel like is due to break or are you are you over it? Are you not going to are you not going to entertain us by continuing to pick these uh, these Baltus horses outside of California? You know, I think it's hard. I think if you follow a circuit, like a lot of us do, you know, we follow a certain circuit. When you when you see a, a trainer who is is so successful on that circuit, I think sometimes it can blind you to to situations when they leave outside of there. It's like I know how good Richie Baltus goes, and I know how he can improve a horse and the kind of move ups he can get on horses. And when I see those horses go to other places, I, I feel like I want to I want to support Richie Baltus in that situation when the world doesn't know he's as good as he is. It's, you know, but it's like I said, it's banging your head against the wall sometimes. And that can work amazing well, sometimes when you catch a trainer on the upswing. I, specifically, you know, I'm thinking of somebody like Arno Delacour when he started first moving horses around and you know knowing what he's capable of, and somebody like that having success right away or. Uh, years ago because he's been around a long time now though certainly this year his success rate has gone up somebody like charlie baker it seems like some trainers could come in fully formed other trainers it seems like it takes time i always use the example of steve asmussen's first saratoga where you know he couldn't hit water if he fell out of a boat but then of course eventually you figure out the new pattern you come up with a new program Uh, aiden o'brien another example for years was a big bet against he had a, a program of shipping to the usa that while selectively um, successful when the horses were good enough, generally speaking, the program wasn't very good, switched things up, started giving them all Lasix. I don't know what else specifically went in the program. Seemed like they started breaking a little better. All of a sudden, he was winning races left and right. So just because these things aren't set in stone, they're not necessarily going to last forever. The other point I want to make about this, and this is something I've been meaning to talk about on the show for, gosh, since pretty much since Bob Baffert's Travers Day, I remember we had this conversation, you know, there was a a talking point in the week before the Travers about Baffert and his ability to ship into New York. Sometimes I think when the sample is small enough and the examples aren't particularly extreme, I think what happens with some of this stuff is, as much as I agree with everything Jonathan said in general, sometimes you get into what I call the commentator's curse. And the commentator's curse is a real thing that I believe has science behind it. You'll see it on a ball game all the time. You know, this pitcher hasn't walked a guy in 30 innings and then he walks the next batter. A field goal kicker is 12 for 12 on the season from 30 to 45 yards. Whoops, wide right. Um, and, and sometimes I think what happens, and this specifically I think is maybe what happened with Baffert um, with his shippers into New York is the there's a lot of randomness and there's a lot of sort of, you know, noise rather than signal when we're looking at data, particularly small sample size data. And just when that data gets to a point where people who do podcasts such as us feel the need to point it out, that's when regression to the mean happens because it almost necessarily has to and therefore makes 
the commentator look like kind of an idiot. Mike Hogan, what do you think of that theory? Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned it because that's exactly the, the, the point I wanted to make about Baltus, and we'll talk about Phil D'Amato maybe in the Raven run as well because he's got a runner in there. He similarly had limited success out of California. Uh, I think Baltus and D'Amato, that will change. The sample size is still small enough. They have good horses. They tend to spot them very well in California. It's only a matter of time before the tide turns. I think it's different than uh, a trainer like Kieran McLaughlin, who for years has had the same patterns over and over again. And we talked about it earlier. The, a lot of the spots are determined not necessarily by him, but by one of his key owners – and he certainly has a program that works fantastic in New York State. It frankly does not work nearly as well in other jurisdictions for other big races. I'll get into some of the details, but but it's a market thing. It's not to say that these horses can't win. It's just that they are routinely overbet. They are routinely way shorter in odds than they should be compared to their likelihood of winning. And if you're wanting to take two to one or three to one on one of these horses, hoping that he's going to be the first winner that Kieran has had in the state of Kentucky since 2008, well, good luck to you. <laughs> All right. Anything else from you, JK, on this commentator's curse, uh, that whole concept or anything that you want to touch on before we dive in to these public handicapper races? Just real quick, I'll just encourage people in general, um, when you pull stats on DRF Formulator, you know, and, and you get to the year of the screen where, you know, it has the runners, look at the runners and, 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 and yeah. try to assess what yeah. happened a little bit. Because yeah. I think what will happen, what you'll notice sometimes is that, you know, uh, even with John Sadler, it's like you looked at John Sadler as this record and this, but he's running 10 to 1 shots and he's running 12 to 1 shots. And it's more of a problem when you're getting beat with, with horses that are likely to win. So, just whatever you're looking at, I would always try to to make sure you're looking at the horses. And then the other thing, which is just a real basic formulator thing you should do anyways, is once you kind of go to the broad thing, John Sadler out of California, then do John Sadler dirt out of California. Mm -hmm. John Sadler route mm -hmm. dirt out of California. And just mm -hmm. try to narrow it down as much as you can because the more specific you can be, the better the story, the, the more true the story is that you're trying to interpret Absolutely. And I'll give one more example before we switch over to the races uh, that we're going to talk about for tomorrow. Uh, yesterday at Keeneland, there was a Bill Mott runner, I think six to one on the morning line, maiden two year old making second career start and getting Lasix. OK, this horse opened at seven or eight to five, six to one morning line off of a really, really dull debut at 20 something to one. I mean, I actually, you know, passed some horses at Kentucky Downs first start, but was was never a factor. Didn't get a very competitive buyer speed figure. Big price in the debut. Now gets Lasix in the second career start. I pulled Bill Mott, <clears throat> two-year-olds getting Lasix, second career start. He was he one for 20-something. 15 of them at odds of five to one or less were losers. You know, this is just the sort of thing where a lot of betters see, oh my God, the debut was just a walk in the park and now he's for real. He's adding the Lasix. This is go time. Let's bet. And then you get two to one on a horse that runs a dull fifth. What do you think about that, Jonathan? Is that something you've observed as well? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think, that, like I said, the deeper you can dig on a situation to understand what's happening, you know, because I, I would imagine, sorry for this. The red zone is for loading and <laughs> unloading only, Jonathan. Don't forget. No, what I'm saying is, is I think that, you know, I would imagine that Bill Mott's second time starter stats are okay. And I bet you, you know, they're probably not bad, I would imagine. And, and he's just the type of trainer you would you would expect him to improve second time out. Right, right. Um, but if you dig deeper, right. you find the late six and you look right. that these horses are five to one and getting beat. That tells you something that you need to know that, like, my, like Mike said, it might not necessarily suggest that the horse doesn't have a likelihood of winning. But the fact that the market is going yeah. to be shorter than right. the horse should be. Right. That horse had no business right. being seven to five. Right. And, you know, you gotta, that's what it is. Right. Isn't there yep. some funny quirk with the Mott stats about how he does with two-year-olds, uh, Phillies versus Colts? I feel bad. I don't. I don't have this off the top of my head, but I know there there's like a, a, a stat that's become a talking point on Twitter that's interesting and kind of had a reason behind it. And I'm absolutely spacing on what it is. Can either of you guys <laughs> bail me out here? Oh, I don't know. I know. I know that's the case for Larry Jones. Um, and I can maybe do a little digging to see if, if I can yeah. figure out anything for Mott. But, Take a look. How does it work with Larry Jones? Uh, he's just, you know, I mean, Larry Jones 
I mean, you think of all the great Larry Jones runners. Um, you're going to think of five or six Phillies for every every Colt or every Gelding. Um, and also think of all the great Larry Jones runners you can think of. You're going to think of a bunch of dirt horses before you think of turf. So he he is a trainer that that uh, completely skews dirt Phillies. He actually had a I think a two year old debuting on the turf. A Colt two year old Colt debuting on the turf was. Uh, a, a brother to I'm a chatterbox. And I immediately said, I don't need to know anything more than knowing Larry Jones is putting this horse on the turf first out toss right. toss. Just I mean, may, maybe eventually he'll get to the dirt and become a runner. But, but you know, if it was Chad Brown putting the horse on the turf, that's one thing. Larry Jones, you, you, his percentage of turf runners versus his dirt runners, so many more dirt runners than turf for other trainers. It's, it's completely flipped. Neil Drysdale, for instance, I think it's, well, though, though he's certainly trained some good dirt runners over the oh, years yeah, too. For sure. But, but the, um, I do get that. I think horse players are in tune to thinking about the difference between trainers who are good on one surface or another, though, obviously it changes over the years, but I do think that's an interesting thing to look at that. Um, I do believe there's some signal in, especially with younger horses looking at Phillies versus Colts. And there's a reason for it. I mean, they, they talk about this a lot in the UK in form study in the UK. And it's the idea that uh, Phillies are very often a lot easier, like two-year-old Phillies, especially they're easier to get fit from fit than the Colts are because of their lighter frames. So certain training methods are going to be more successful. So it's just another interesting little piece of data you can try to parse using DRF formulator. All right, guys, we've got just over 20 minutes left on the show today. I think we should go ahead and get to the public handicapper races. If anybody out there listening live wants to ask questions, go ahead and uh, you submit them through Spreaker. We will try to get to them as we go through these races or at the end if we have a chance. If they're more general questions, we might save them at this point for Tuesday's show as we don't have a ton of time left. But let's start with Belmont Park. A race seven is the Sleepy Hollow Mike, we'll keep it with you. What do you have for us here in this two-year-old race? <clears throat> well, these Belmont races, um, the, the way I see them is at least some of the later ones are, are relatively chalky. The, the seventh, the Sleepy Hollow, uh, I think is the most wide open race of the ones that we're going to talk about at Belmont tomorrow um, because there's a lot of different ways you can go in here. And I think – the winner is going to be coming out of the uh, Syndergaard's debut, uh, which, of course, we've talked about Syndergaard probably too much on the podcast. Um, but he just kind of he's the presence. He's sort of the um, uh, what's the word? You know, he's he's not in the race, but his presence is is deeply felt in this race. Um, how many next out winners there were, uh, including Syndergaard, there were five next out winners from that race. There were two others that ran second. Um, just the biggest live race of the Saratoga meet for two-year-olds, in my opinion. Uh, the horse that I want, and I'm hoping that this morning line is correct, because eight to one would be fantastic for Mission Command, who watch his debut if you haven't. Incredible. I mean, the horse almost fell ran on, closed some amazing ground at five and a half furlongs to dead heat for third. Then he comes back and he faces Syndergaard in his next start. Actually only loses by three lengths, is six lengths clear of the rest of the field, which obviously was a race that came back very live. Then the start after that, he's he's two to five and he barely wins, but he wins. Uh, he's some er erratic stuff in the stretch. Rudy's adding the, the blinkers. They're stretching him out a little bit. Uh, he's absolutely the one I want out of the cinder guard race. It's facing all of these others. And, uh, uh, you know, I think some of the favorites here are a little bit vulnerable. I I'm hoping he doesn't get too overbet and we get something close to the eight to one. I was seeing this race as, uh, Unfortunately, I, I was not as uh, as clever in terms of being able to come up with any kind of price on the morning line. I, I thought that gold for the king, as much as he was sort of a seeming flow downgrade in a sense last time, benefiting from dueling horses up front, I thought it could almost be a similar situation here and uh, just looked to me like, like he might be the best closer. So I was going to be kind of boring and pick number four, gold for the king. JK, how about you? Where did you land in this spot? Yeah, I mean, I, I wish I could elaborate more, but I, I'm with Mike, and there's no way we're going to get 8-1 on Mission Command. 
um, everyone's going to see the, the center guard line and, and, uh, and that, you know, that can make it a little bit tricky, but no, I, I think that he's probably the most likely winner. I mean, I, I think that, I'm sorry, not the most likely winner. I think he's a very likely winner. I think runway loot, runaway loot is probably the most likely winner just on those, those two races that, um, that, that he ran this summer, um, at Belmont. So, uh, you know, I, I don't, not terribly, can't get terribly creative here. Um, there's always the weird angle with these horses, with, with, with them stretching out, you know, that you always, when you're, when you're seeing these two-year-olds that are going from sprints to, to a mile that weird stuff can happen and horses can really excel at that extra distance. So, uh, but for me, it'd be mission command. Yeah, it is. It's a great point about the distance. It's not, it's not one of these mile two turn races where you can start using those angles, um, to, 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 to come up with something clever. What do we have here? Maybe one of them is one going the, the, the Belmont mile only. Uh, yeah, the Fuki story. Right. But uh, right. Is, is that something you thought about at all, Mike, in your handicapping of this race? You know, I considered it a little bit. But um, yeah, to be honest, I didn't think about it too heavily because tell me a Fuki story one. He barely beat Heavy Metal, who is a horse that um, uh, Mission Command uh, beat in in one of his earlier races. So, you know, it's it's kind of an a long elongated sprint, I guess you could say. And, and you know, I look for horses that uh, seem to want a little bit of extra ground. That's that's partly why I landed on Mission Command. From a pedigree standpoint, doesn't necessarily say at least on the dam side. Um, but I'm hoping the one turn mile is fine. And I actually think it's it's a nice preface to this. I think Rudy's going to have a big day at uh, and. Uh, and, and Michael Dubb, too, have a big day at, uh, at Belmont tomorrow. Let's move it along to the Empire Distaff Handicap. Jonathan, did you have a selection for us in here? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I really am boring. Wonder, I think Wonder Girl, like, towers over the field. I don't – I mean, I couldn't even come up with anything really creative. I just think that – I think that she's back. I think she's always been meant to be a, a top-class filly, and uh, she's, she seemed to have kind of – found her her form again she had an excuse last time in the mud um but her race two back just absolutely swallows this field and i just don't see how any of these horses can beat her well and you know wonder gal who i'll select too uh it is a famous horse in drf podcast history on the very first uh drf players podcast i she was among however many races we handicapped that day one of one of the first horses i ever uh, gave out on the show when she ran so big uh I guess it was as a as a two year old back then, um, so so you know I, I'm a sucker for Wonder Gal. I've always liked her physically, and I, I think she should be up to the task. and And does seem like her form is uh, is headed in the right direction. Mike Hogan, how about you? Yeah, you know I think this is the the, the Sleepy Hollow is the most interesting betting race because there's a lot of different ways you can go. I think I think Wonder Gal um, is the best filly in the race. Um, I guess there's a possibility where, you know, she's maybe a little bit vulnerable in just her third start off of a long layoff or start going this far in quite a while. Um, but, you know, if she runs a race, she's she's the, certainly the horse to beat. I think Bar of Gold is a really solid one. I'm, I'm actually disappointed they didn't enter her on the turf because her, um, her dam side has a ton of turf pedigree. I know they had entered her in a previous state bred turf race. But uh, they scratched her out when the turf came up soft. Uh, I would love to see Bar of Gold um, facing some good turf fillies um, at a good price. But, but yeah, it's, it's kind of those two for me. I, I guess Rudy is the other way you want to go. But I, I just don't really see any of these three-year-olds, three-year-old fillies stepping up and, and competing with the older fillies. I mean, I've talked about it before, and we'll talk about it a little bit in the Raven run. I just don't think the three-year-olds are that good this year, and I think we're going to continue to see three-year-olds getting trounced when they step up against older. Time to talk about race 10 at Belmont on Saturday. It's the Empire Classic. Mike Hogan, what are we doing in here? Rudy again, Royal Posse for me. I mean, this is a horse, <clears throat> look, he just he never runs a bad race. He's beaten some of these horses uh, in, in previous races, and the ones that maybe he didn't, um, he maybe didn't have uh, the pace scenario his own way. I think he gets a good trip. I think he uh, is a decent price. He's an alternative to one of those three-year-olds that I think is going to get a little over bet. Uh, and look, since Rudy claimed him, how many races has he run? What is it, 13? And he's never been out of the exact. I mean, that's pretty tough to do. Uh, he's just an old warrior that shows up every time, and uh, I'll take him. Yeah, it makes sense at, uh, at a, at a short, short-ish price anyway in there. 
How about you, Jonathan? Are you inclined to agree with Mike or look to a horse like uh, Governor Malibu for uh, Christophe Clement? Maybe he's finally found his friends. Uh, no, Governor Malibu. I do agree with Mike. But I also, just for the sake of not picking the same horse as Mike every time, I've just been following him. <laughs> I, I do. I, I kind of like the other Rudy, too. I, I mean, I'm, I don't hate good luck, Gus. I felt like um, might have had an excuse that day, was on the on the rail, and I think the outside was the place you wanted to be at Laurel that day. Um, and, and you know, he, he, so in that regard, he was against the track there. And, and, and the other thing is, is Rudy's going so well right now. I, I looked it up before we called, uh, yeah. before we got on the phone. He's, uh, in his last 30 days, he's 39% uh, with a $3.85 ROI. Um, in the last 30 yeah. days at Belmont. So that's, that's pretty impressive. He's, he's got things going the right direction. His barn is hot, and, and we know how those things can go. When the barn gets hot, there's uh, start spotting horses with confidence, and, and uh, good things can happen. So, you know, I, I would definitely think that Royal Posse is more likely, but uh, good luck, Gus, would be covered on, on, on tickets that I was playing. I, I, certain trainers, we all have relationships where we're simpatico with certain trainers and not simpatico with other trainers. For me, an example of a trainer that it seems like whenever I pick one of his horses, they don't run particularly well is Tom Albertrani. And so I'm not going to uh, do Tom Albertrani and our friends at West Point Thoroughbreds the disservice of picking Empire Dreams in the race. But I did want to just ask your guys' impressions Obviously, uh, won this race last year, has run some very fast races in his day, prepped last time. Is he somebody you'd consider throwing on your tickets to, J.K., or, or do you have enough? Um, yeah, no, I mean, I, I think the horse is, is usable. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. He'll get a little I, overlooked, too. And I think Tom kind of gets a hard a hard time. You know, we've, we've actually, you know, I, I think that he gets, he, he kind of, gets picked on a little bit you know i think he does a good job for for some of the situations he's in you know i think it's hard to train for godolphin and then you can't geld horses to, you know they don't you know it's, it's hard probably to drop some of their horses and things like that horses that should be dropped and, Near and so yeah they, yeah they won't drop them in the godolphin name absolutely so you know i i think that he kind of gets a, a a tough break about that and so i you know i think he's a very capable trainer and, and empire dreams is one that makes a little bit of sense i think he had an excuse at at, at uh at finger lakes last time what, what what was the excuse there that you saw? Well, I mean, the track uh, was was you know it was wet, so maybe the horse didn't didn't really like that portion of it, and uh, you know the, we kind of had the inside a little bit good that day, so I think that that might have been another thing. He was in the in the he was wide and he's in the sixth path, turning for home and and finished in the sixth path, so that definitely wasn't to his advantage. Well, and I want to just point out, I didn't mean, I'm glad you did offer that defense of Albatroni, but I wasn't meaning to impugn him or his abilities at all. It's just, you know how that is as horse players, there are just certain trainers you just feel in tune with and others and others not for whatever reason. It just must be some quirk of the way the brain works. It, that doesn't just happen to me, does it, Mike? No, no, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, uh, we all get... Uh, there are certain trainers that uh, you're, you, you hit the nail on the head, Pete, you know, certain trainers that we, we love to look for. And then other trainers that we, we often uh, don't. And as much as I'll even mention uh, a trainer like Nick Zito, as much as I've mentioned some of his stats, I've actually probably got a, a really positive ROI betting Nick Zito horses uh, in my lifetime. A calf, a cowboy was one that I scored a nice score on. Uh, mentioned that horse. right here on the DR yeah. podcast. Yeah. Jamaica. I, I had a single pick pick threes and pick fours ending in him when he won not too long ago. So, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's, there are trainers that you, you sometimes get in tune with and, and some other trainers where no matter when you bet them, they beat you or they lose. And then you don't bet them, they beat you. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, I think that's just natural for a lot of horse players. It sounds like there's a backstory there was uh my buddy Alex, Nick's son, giving you a hard time on Twitter or something for uh, p posting negative Zito stats, Mike? Uh, no, not your buddy Alex, but certainly some other uh, industry <laughs> folks have, have given me some guff for for not even – I mean, look, you know, I actually noticed that he's he's got as many wins at Keeneland in 2016 as he does in the state of New York in 2016. Some people took that as a negative for – oh. I can't win in New York. I took it as, look, don't overlook him at Keeneland. He's actually sending live horses down there. It's a funny thing. And, you know, it makes me realize a missed opportunity. When we had Norm Cassie on the show just a few weeks ago, I was talking to him in, I, I wish I could remember the particulars. My brain is a sieve, folks. Yeah. But uh, 
Oh, you he had, gave me a hard time. Yeah, you had posted some sort yeah. of negative Cassie yeah. stat, yeah. Um, and he was off not in a not angry, but just like in sort of yeah. a, a funny way, but yeah. just a, a way yeah. that makes you realize when you post these stats, people read them and notice. Yeah. Was oh, all yeah. fired up about uh, you know oh, Teppin yeah. and Catch a Glimpse being the only two that had uh, <laughs> that, that had that had violated the stat. And I meant to bring it up on air. I wanted you guys to to have a little to have a take your Twitter fight to uh, to the airwaves here on the DRF Players Podcast, but I forgot to do it. But it is it is funny. I mean, you must get that. Oh yeah, those can't be the only two instances of that. Oh, where sure. you know he and and then after he and I had the our sort of joking conversation about it, he was t- talking about uh, you know he had said I guess to his dad um, you know well a stat is what a stat is. It's like yeah. if somebody wants to quote it like whatever. Yeah. It's just it's right. just a number. And right. and I think that's your attitude about it, Mike. But uh, yeah. some people well, uh, they don't they don't always take it in in the spirit in which I think you intend it. Do you attribute it, that maybe to some of the the general? negativity and criticisms that are doled out on Twitter or what, what's your view of that situation before we get to the Raven run? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think what I do, you know, I'll say, uh, Bill Mott hasn't won with a two year old, uh, first time starter on dirt at Saratoga in the last five years. And everyone, and I'll just put that out there and everyone's like, well, why do you think that is? He's a good trainer. You're saying he's a bad trainer. He can't train. I'm like, no, no, I'm not, I'm not implying anything. I'm not saying this means that the man, this hall of fame trainer doesn't know how to train horses. I'm not, I, I don't, there could be 10 factors as to why that this might be the case. And I sitting in an office in New York, nowhere near these horses on the back. I have no clue. I'm just putting this out there saying, here, this is this is what it is. It's funny you mentioned that that stat about Cassie, because I hadn't heard that Norm was annoyed by the one, the, the Teppan and Catch a Glimpse one. But I do remember putting one out a couple years ago saying that he hadn't Cassie hadn't won a dirt uh, route or a dirt race, maybe at Saratoga in, in X number of years. And and then Norm later was like, oh, I guess we can win. It's so, I guess we can win on dirt. You know? <laughs> I, I may have. I think don't, I shouldn't have said if I made it sound like he was annoyed. That, no, I mischaracterized no, it. No, it was just I, we were just discussing it. it, it I, yeah, no, I, and I don't doubt it. You know, I mean, look, I'm not trying to impugn anybody's abilities or, or question anybody's ability. And my response back to. Uh, to norm was i guess you focused in on that stat and not the stat about how many like seven out of the last 11 two-year-old graded stake turf races you've entered you've won you know like (laughs) pretty funny stuff all right we've got uh, just about seven minutes left on the show today let's take it to keeneland for race number nine the raven run when this race appears jk and i project to be several adult beverages in sitting in the green room, making fun of people we don't like. JK, who's going to win the Raven run? Oh, man. Uh, I have to, for sanity purposes, I have to have something on Lightstream because I bet her for my <laughs> my uh, my life in the last race that Paula Queen won. And so if, if, I can, if she wins and I don't have a piece, I, I would be just devastated. Um, I, I, I mean, I'm interested in Curlin's approval. Um, off of those races at Gulfstream. I think those races were pretty impressive. I think the horse can run a little bit. Um, uh, from all accounts, it looks like the horse is working well at, uh, down at Gulfstream. And, and the, the confidence to ship the horse up here for, for this spot, I, I think, is uh, is one that, that, uh, that people should pay attention to. And so, uh, although I'll be betting Lightstream a little bit, uh, there'll definitely be a little Curlin's approval. And that's the type of horse I would use in a tournament. Curlin's approval was uh, was the one that... that uh... I don't want to say stood out like most likely winner, but but was one that I wanted to do some more digging on specifically to see what the situation is with uh, Marty Wolf's and shippers at Keeneland, which is actually work I I have yet to do and can can do while Mike Hogan gives us his opinion in the Raven Run. Oh, boy, this is my favorite race that we're going to talk about. First, I'm going to talk about some of the horses that I don't like. Um, Lightstream, you're right, Jonathan. Um, you know, she's a really good filly, but after that, aside from that debut, toss out that debut, she's kind of a mid eighties buyer speed figure filly. And, you know, I mean, she's run some races where you thought she might win and she didn't win. So she could win coming off this little bit of a layoff is a little concern for me, especially Brian Lynch dirt sprints last five years between 60 and a hundred day layoff Oh, for 19 with just two seconds, uh, five thirds, a lot of short priced losers, like clearly now a couple times at two to one. He had another horse get beat at, at, at odds on, a bunch of them at five to one or lower. So, you know, look, she, she's a player, but she's no lock. Um, I think she's vulnerable. Same goes for, for 
Bellamentary. I mean, we talked about Phil D'Amato outside of California. He's something like three for 40 something. I don't have the numbers in front of me. Low ROI. He'll eventually win with one of these, but I think she's going to be a little over bet. Curlin's approval. I mean, I say take anything that happens at Gulfstream with a grain of salt when it ships elsewhere. Working well at Gulfstream does not necessarily translate to uh, winning at Keeneland. See um, the nightcap yesterday at Keeneland, for example, of that. Uh, So there's a lot of – and then Lucy and Ethel, I mean, she's in some ways perhaps the most likely winner. But if if she gets hooked at all, I think she's vulnerable. Second start in a long time. First start for Tom Amos. I think there's a regression there. Um, so, so all of that goes back to the horse that I love. There's a horse in here I love. And I think that the 15 to one morning line is actually a little low. I think I might even get 20 or 25 to one. And that's number three, Grace's treasure. Uh, this is a filly lightly raced who debuted in the most live maiden race of the Keeneland meet in, in spring. Carino next out winner. Julerette next out winner, Hilarious Brown, Debbie Doro, Silver Sydney. Ironically, one of the only non horses not to win next out was Grace's Treasure, who, who actually ran fourth. And then the start after that, she broke her maiden convincingly. Part of it is I think they stretched her out a little uh, t- too soon, cut her back. She won convincingly, stepped up against Older at Indiana Grand. She won, including a, a couple next out winners in Samsonian who is an older mare who just won again yesterday. And then if you watch her dogwood, she was by far the best. She got all, she, she broke a little slow. She rushed up on the rail. She had some traffic trouble on the turn. She finally got clear. She re-rallied three strides past the wire. She's two lengths ahead of those horses that finished one, two. She ran huge in that race. And then look at the two works since the race, bullet, bullet. And there's one little secret that you guys probably know, but not everybody knows about. The Keeneland.com site is a fantastic resource for clocker notes on workouts. If you go to racing and then workouts and clocker comments or in today report where it will actually show you the notes for every horse that's entered, you'll see not just the works, but you'll see the clocker comments. It doesn't have every horse, but it has many of the horses horses the note for grace's treasure is the kind of note you never see they use the word very twice was very full of run very impressive out in 112 flat this is a horse that's improving that is better than the buyer speed figures that will be a big price because of the connections and the lower speed figures is working fantastic at the track she's going to get a great setup she's going to be a big price grace's treasure all day every day in the raven run for me Quite a filibuster there for Mike Hogan, who's hoping that Mike Ewing's record in the Raven run proves to be better than Patrick Ewing's record in various game <laughs> sevens. Jonathan, uh, during that, uh, dur- it, it was a good speech, so I, I don't, I'm not, I, I don't want to make fun too much, but, but dur- during the filibuster, uh, Mike did uh, manage to lift his leg on your two selections. I figured I'd give you a chance to, to defend yourself before we close out the show today. Wow, well, sounds like a head-to-head bet to me if I've ever seen one. But... <laughs> if we're doing it this time, you're settling on terms. No more of this namby-pamby, uh, uh, you know, maybe it's a bet, maybe it's not a bet. So let's oh, talk. Well, this will do. I, I've got Curlin's approval. Okay. If if Mike wins, I will do 48 hours because I kind of still owe him for the last one. If I win, Mike does another 24 hours for me with the, with the Twitter avatar. And the bet okay. is Curlin's approval straight up against Grace's treasure that neither has to win. Just one of them has to – it's just a head-to-head. Whoever Doesn't, finishes – whoever horse finishes ahead is the winner. It could be seventh and eighth. That's the bet. And it doesn't have to be pretty. It, exactly. <laughs> I mean you could always right. make a bet my horse has to win, you know, and yeah. it's, a, it's a push if not. I mean, yeah. Which is I realized what I should have done. I could have gotten in on this last week. I felt bad knowing I was shocked at how much Mike's horse was bet. I thought time and motion would have been a fraction of the price of either of your horses. So I didn't think it fair to suggest a head to head situation, but what I should have just said is, but time and motion has to win. And then you'd both be having some pretty ridiculous avatars this week. I blew it. And I apologize to the audience. JK, you left your mic on. I assume you have something to say. Oh, my fault. No, I was just I... <laughs> sleep no, on the I... switch as yeah, usual. Yeah, my fault. <laughs> <laughs> Quick, very fast 
closing, not even a closing thought, a closing sentence, Mike? Uh, so we're um, live uh, this week and next week, 9.15 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, but starting Breeders' Cup week and then after that, we're going to 11 a.m. Eastern time live. So uh, set your calendars. If you're on the West Coast, it makes it a little easier for you. You can uh, listen to the show live during your morning coffee. Um, but that'll be fun. Also, bonus show that week. We're going to be doing Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Some special stuff. I will give you the particulars of it when we meet next week. Jonathan, a closing sentence from you. Congratulations to our buddy Pipes, our, our guest a few weeks ago. Uh, the, the jockey for Angel Cruz uh, made his second trip with Angel Cruz for their second mount in a graded stakes race at Keeneland and got their second win. They're two for two, uh, both on price horses. So uh, both on the number four horse too. And, and so congratulations to him and uh, the success that uh, looks like Angel is going to have on the horizon. I did mean to give uh, props to our buddy Chris Pipido for his jock taking down the Psychomore stakes at Keeneland. Uh, I was wondering if you were going to go there. <laughs> all right, folks, that's all the time we have. We will be back on Tuesday if you're playing this weekend, oh, I should thank everybody. I, I'm jumping the gun here because I'm seeing the, the, the seconds tick away. want to thank Gabby Gaudet for joining us. Always uh, fabulous to have a true pro like her join the proceedings. want to thank Jonathan Kitchen. I want to thank airport security at uh, the airport in Austin for not taking uh, Jonathan Kitchen out of there at any point during the show. want to thank Mike Hogan. And most of all, want to thank all of you for listening Always great to be podcasting for you guys here on the DRF Players Podcast, and we will be back next week. If you're playing this weekend, may you win all your photos. 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 Photos.